So, okay. Oh, he's fixated on the um, recycle bin, I think. Can you just like peek out to see if the trash truck came? This is kind of what set the, set the tone today. He likes on Tuesdays after school, the trash trucks have already come. But since I brought him home early today, oh, no. the trash trucks are, <laughs> the recycle hadn't been picked up. So he oh. didn't understand why we couldn't bring it back inside. Oh. So he's just, I think he's, that could be what he's fixated on. Is that a common thing? Like there's a bunch of little fixations yes. that he focuses on? Yeah. Um, his, he, so he has autism as one of his diagnosis. Um, do you want me to continue sure. with what I was, yep. okay. It is a late and chilly December okay. afternoon in Hilliard, Ohio, where Josh and I have been welcomed into Oren's home and are sitting in a cozy living room talking about a kid whose smile is as contagious as his hair is red. I am Seth Carnell, and this is the Go Shout Love podcast. One of the goals of this podcast is to not only be able to share the stories and backgrounds of the kiddos we feature and their families, but to also give you an audio glimpse into their daily lives. Oren has autism, and his mother Katie will tell you more about that, but to give you that glimpse, a slight change in his day can become disruptive to him. It can be something as simple as the recycle bin that has been put out on the curb for the truck to pick up, and it hasn't been taken in yet. I mention this because you will also hear him in the background as his frustration is being let out. It is short-lived, as you will also hear the wrestling of Legos throughout the conversation, which is a pastime for Orm. We are here on a Tuesday, which is a busy day in this blended household, and Katie was kind enough to allow us to invade her home for a little while in order for us to get to know Oren and his family. Katie fills us in on the family makeup as well as the long journey to discover his diagnosis of coffin Cyrus syndrome. She will also tell you about the challenge of caring for Oren and how that also turns into what this amazing kid provides for this family and what he teaches them every day. In this conversation is Josh Veach, our executive director of Go Shout Love. Also in the room with us is Oren's shy big brother Beckett, who is an amazing almost teenager that delights in being around and helping with Oren. I wish you all could see that in person. It truly is heartwarming. My son Oren is 10 years old. He just celebrated his 10th birthday last Wednesday. And he is a fiery redhead with curly hair and a very curious personality. Um, he is completely nonverbal, but you may hear him screaming vocalizations. He does that when he's happy or upset or riddled with anxiety. He just and lets those outbursts out. There will be days where he doesn't let a sound out where we're just kind of taken back by not hearing him or those vocalizations. Um, yeah, he's playful and sweet and cuddly at times. What does he like to do? He loves to build Legos. He loves Duplo Legos. I think we own every single set <laughs> that there is. Um, right now he's really into fire trucks and Legos. So he is really creative and building different types of Lego houses and creations and then likes to tear them down and start all over. Um, he loves anticipation play. So if you think of like like a toddler where you're, you know, act like you're going to get him and chase him mm -hmm. and he loves that anticipation. Um, that's usually what brings him to a giggle the most. Um, he loves going to school and just being around his friends. Yeah. Um, introduce us. So you're the only one joining us for the conversation today, but introduce us to the family members that are closest to him and that love him the most. Um, Oren and Oren's father, Joey, um, and I have uh, together have another son, Beckett, who is 12. And, um, that relationship since fizzled when Oren was probably around the age five, but together Joey and I have continued to co-parent closely throughout the years. 
and just be there for our boys. Since then, I have remarried, and my husband's name is Bobby. He has three children. He has a 16-year-old named Jonathan, a 12-year-old named Kaylee, and a 10-year-old named Christian, which is interesting because we have two sets of kids with that are similar in age, two 12-year-olds and two 10-year-olds. Um, but it's pretty wild to see the difference in our 10-year-olds. Oren is much like... He's very developmentally delayed, so we see that difference in the age there. So in an earlier conversation, I think you mentioned that Oren doesn't take a breath of life for granted. What do, what do you mean by that? How, how does, what does that life, what does that look like for him? Yeah, Oren has had a lot of respiratory issues throughout the years um, where just basically his respiratory starts to fail him. He gets a virus and it happens really quickly. His airways and lungs start to collapse They or they fill with infection. He has had countless hospitalizations with pneumonia that requires him to be on BiPAP or nearly intubated with just oxygen keeping things open. Um, so for me, <clears throat> when I think about Oren and all that he's been through. I think about the days where he's vibrant and healthy and happy and enjoying life. And he really truly has taught me so much because he has been through what he's been through. And I think that he understands and knows what that feels like. And he doesn't take life for granted. Where sometimes like the little things you know, we unpack our bags because we have been through something minimal and it's upsetting. And it just reminds me that, you know, not to sweat the small stuff, mm -hmm. that there, it is a beautiful life despite all that he endures. And I just think like it's a good way of putting things into perspective through his eyes. Yeah. He can't afford... He, his life hasn't given him the luxury of taking any breath for granted. Yeah. Yeah. So tell us, um, take us kind of back to the beginning and, and what, uh, from a medical standpoint, what um, the beginning looked like for him and kind of when challenges were introduced and how you started to recognize what was going on. <coughs> um, I had a really great pregnancy with Oren. Um, there were a few red flags throughout my pregnancy, but for the most part, things were really good. Um, when it was time to deliver him, I was in active labor, and it's like he was ready to be born, but was like there wasn't a lot of movement. Um, so, under you know being at the hospital for countless hours, they realized that I just had an abundance of amniotic fluid. We later learned, and I was diagnosed with something called poly polyhydraminose, which is where your body keeps making amniotic fluid. So Oren was essentially floating around in there um, because of the amount of amniotic fluid. And after he was born, we learned that that happened because of his low muscle tone called hypotonia and his inability to swallow the amniotic fluid, which is a natural thing for when you're in utero. So my body kept producing it, but it wasn't going anywhere. So it made delivery very difficult. Um, at the hospital, they end up having to do what's called like a slow leak, which it sounds terrible, but they had buckets underneath me just trying mm. to get this amniotic fluid to get him out safely. Um, which did eventually happen, and he was born pretty quickly, which was kind of another occurrence that happened, that he was born so quickly that he wasn't able to express, like, the mucus and things in his airway, which kind of makes sense to what he's been through now. He's still mm -hmm. not able to clear those secretions. Right. We use um, an airway clearance device every night as part of his, his bedtime routine, which is a vest that shakes him mm -hmm. for 20 minutes. Um, just to keep his airways clear. He has a cough assist because he doesn't cough st strong enough, strongly enough. Mm -hmm. um, and we use suction machines. So when he was born, we 
just spent two days, the average two days in the hospital. There was an incident in the hospital where the nurse came in to do vitals and we thought we were all ready to go home and he had turned blue and had to go spend a few hours in the NICU just because he was just wasn't clearing those secretions. But they felt confident in sending us home and he checked out okay and we got home and from there I really started to have a lot of issues with just keeping him like producing enough breast milk breastfeeding was extremely challenging, um, which I knew it was a difficult thing to tackle anyway. So I just kept kept on and got the help I needed when I needed it and got, you know, had a lot of support. But it wasn't until we started to go to those frequent checkups where he just wasn't gaining weight. Mm -hmm. He which was concerning because we were trying to keep keep him <laughs> keep him um, nourished. So it was around three months when I took him to his follow up, and his pediatrician at the time, you know, I could tell she had a lot of concerns in her eyes. But I I went in really optimistic mm -hmm. that we he, she was going to help me, you know get some weight on him. He had lost a, l a little bit of weight. And instead, she said that he was failure to thrive and that she wanted to um, refer us to see a neurologist. So from there, I scheduled the appointment with Nationwide Children's Hospital at his three month, around right around three months, met with the neurologist when she recommended we do a brain MRI and went back to meet with the neurologist. And it was at that appointment that she said that the brain MRI was abnormal and she suspected that Oren may have a genetic syndrome, which I was pretty taken back because I didn't know what to expect. I knew from being a mother previously to Beckett, I knew that something was different about Oren, but I wasn't necessarily thinking that he had anything medically wrong with him. Mm -hmm. um, so that was the start of our genetic journey and we were referred to a geneticist. You and said that was at three months? It was right around three months and it wasn't until he was three and a half years old when we were able to get a genetic diagnosis. So we went through several years of genetic testing and with that it was pretty excruciating because most mothers, I think you test a child for a disorder, the first thing you're going to do is go home and Google right. the syndrome and what they just tested your child for. Even though the doctors will tell you not to do that, right. <laughs> that's where your mind goes. So sure. I spent a lot of nights awake thinking, well, that has a characteristic of Oren, that mm -hmm. this could be it, mm -hmm. and that's terrifying. Sure. So we went through that journey, which was pretty painful, and right and at- Was the length of that just because of, they were testing two specific syndromes versus like looking at a really broad panel, or what was Yeah, the... so they would test usually two to three syndromes. It was. It felt to me like a little bit of guesswork, but I know the doctor had, you know, he was using abnormalities that he was seeing in Oren and medical complications, like some of the respiratory, and kind of picking a few things to see if it could be that syndrome. So we'd, they'd have, I think they just had like a bank of blood. And so they would just test these syndromes. And, but it would take weeks to months to get the results back. So it's every six months we were yeah. going to see, do we have any answers or not? And so it was just, it was really, really difficult because we just wanted to know how to treat him and how to help him and to keep him healthy. And we had, I felt like I had more questions at that time than answers and I still feel like that. Yeah, so right around three and a half years old, by that point, Oren had started to have seizures pretty frequently and we were trying to treat him for seizures that were changing in the way they presented themselves from time to time so it was really confusing and it was hard to get a clear understanding of what what seizures he was actually having 
Um, it kind of started with febrile seizures and then turned into like more convulsive seizures or focal seizures. Um, and then at that time, we were also seeing a lot of um, behavioral issues um, or behavioral concerns or just things that were new to us. Um, Oren was lining a lot of things up. He, one of, he didn't play with toys. He didn't really smile a lot. Um, so we had our suspicion that he may have autism. So we started to do that testing as well as why we, while we were waiting for genetic testing. So we had a lot of things going on all around a lot of medical issues. Mm -hmm. And it was, a, it was just so overwhelming um, at times. So we had the genetic testing. We started testing for autism and we were working with a neurologist and trying to figure out how to treat, the best way to treat his seizures and if he was heading towards an epilepsy diagnosis, which at that point, when we got the, ep it was all around the same time. I think all three of those diagnoses were in within two weeks of each other, which was pretty heavy. Pretty And those three pretty, being? Yes, those, uh, so um, all within, two to three weeks of each other, Oren was diagnosed with coffin Cyrus syndrome that came back with whole exome sequencing, genetic testing, autism, spectrum disorder, and epilepsy. So we finally had our diagnosis, but we didn't have a lot of answers because we were just handed this very rare <laughs> genetic diagnosis where there wasn't a lot of information out there as to what this syndrome meant and what the future, what Oren's future looked like. Right. So how, what was that like as a mom to uh, take in all yeah. of that information? I think at that point I had developed some really great friendships within our community with other special needs moms. And some of the best advice I had was just to like, take the time to feel those emotions and digest them and not just leap ahead, which was pretty, it was, it was just really hard. It was difficult. I had a lot of questions, but at some point during that time, I transitioned into accepting that my child was unique Mm -hmm. and your first mentality or go-to as a mother is to fix it. So for many years, I went into fix-it mode. Well, how can I fix it? How can I help it, help him? Um, and <laughs> he needs some help. <laughs> I think initially... I just wanted to be sad for my child, mm -hmm. but it, it, I mean, within a couple years and after like countless hours spent, I mean, thousands of hours spent in therapy, he was in PT, OT, speech, feeding therapy. We were going to doctor's appointments. We still have what we call, or what I call appointment season twice a year, where it's just like the beginning of the year and mid year, we're right. just, spending our time going to doctor's appointments and just checking in with everybody or, you know, everybody's running blood work to just check in with him. So, um, I think I've learned, I've definitely learned a lot since his diagnosis, not just in the sense of what the diagnosis means, but as a mother, I've learned that I don't have to fix everything. Mm -hmm. That's not why I get to be Oren's mom. My job is to make sure that he has a great quality of life. Um, so when we do experience the trauma that comes with hospitalizations and you know, seeing Oren's oxygen drop as low as 52% and wondering if that's gonna be the day I'll lose my child, like it's those times when he bounces back and comes into life with a smile and it's like those traumas never happened to him 
that has taught me to not unpack my bags in that grief. Because it's the more food and water you give something, the more it grows. And I think that's the biggest thing I've learned in this journey is to not give all that grief and trauma food and water. Because the more you give it, the harder it is. And it's just this constant dark cloud over your life. Mm. So. How have you found, what ways have you found effective to help not do that? I think Does that for, make sense? Because yeah. I think naturally, yeah. when you're, like you said, there's this place where you naturally, you're, you're feeling something and the feelings are real because the trauma, the situation's real. Like, even if it's somebody else in a different or less than, it's real to them, right? Yeah. Like, it's, it's real. So how do, you, how do you deal with it in a healthy way and then decide, okay, that's enough, no more feeding and watering or... Yeah. Um, for me, it's usually taking the rest of the afternoon after a difficult doctor's appointment and just kind of edging out, just processing those emotions or crying or just finding something that allows me to like be sad. But I just have this way of just being sad and then finding the joy. And I think that's the biggest part of like what Oren has brought to our life is that he has taught all of us to find the joy. Um, yeah, that's been a huge part of just the accepting mm -hmm. this journey. So when you say taking a minute, taking in the afternoon, whatever, it's you're kind of saying, all right, I'm going to deal with everything that I'm deal feeling right now. I'm going to deal with it now versus yeah. carrying it into tomorrow or right. the next day or yeah. the, uh, the next situation and letting it compound, just kind of addressing it as it happens. Yes, I have to. And another thing I've done for myself is to have a job. I've had periods of the past 10 years of not being able to work outside of the home and only being Oren's caretaker. Mm -hmm. And although that is amazing, a few years ago, I realized like why my job, why working outside of the home is so important because I am a person too. I'm not just here to right. be his mom. So having that work-life balance and having getting to be Oren's mom and care, give him all the care he needs, but also knowing that I have a purpose too, mm -hmm. really helps me. Um, that's been, that's probably been one of the most healing parts of my journey. So, um, but it, it gets challenging because when Oren is sick or when he's in the hospital and I miss a lot of work, that sure. brings a, another level of stress. So having a supportive job and family and friends really helps yeah. because it's all a lot of chaos sometimes. Yeah. But other, um, I would say another huge part of our support is the having the Coffin Cyrus Syndrome Foundation, because it was just a group of families that came together that made, a, you know, it started out pretty small, I think back in 2015, 2016, and they set out to make something of that small genetic syndrome mm -hmm. and be there for people. And so every year they put on a conference and bring families together, um, which has been really rewarding to be able to meet other families who live similar lives to us. A lot of the kids are so different, but they're also so, so, so there's so many similarities. And for us having that foundation um, and just their support and friendship has been amazing. Um, a few years ago, we, as a family of seven, Bobby and the five kids, uh, we went to Des Moines, Iowa, which was a very long drive mm -hmm. from Ohio to Des Moines, Iowa, but it was worth it. And we had a really nice time. And while at that conference, I was so moved by the amount of families, but I was also kind of in my emotions as to how those, how other families may have felt when we received our diagnosis and how they probably, you know, if, if you're not on social media or if you don't know how to navigate social media to find other 
um, groups, supportive groups. So after the conference, I reached out to the foundation and with a suggestion <laughs> that turned into my labor of love project, but I reached out and asked if we could, or if they could help me to formulate a new diagnosis welcome packet mm. to send to families of f families who are recently diagnosed with coffin cyrus syndrome so it took a little bit it took probably a year to kind of get things implemented get all the information together yeah. because we wanted to be very particular about what information went into the packet but we wanted to have the support websites a little bit of the there's so many different genetic um, genes that, mm -hmm. that make up coffin cyrus syndrome. For Oren, it's arid 1B, um, and it affects the entire body. For him, nearly almost every organ is affected except for his heart. He has a very healthy heart. We're always happy and usually celebrate with some ice cream after sure. a cardiology appointment just because it's healthy, and that gives me a lot of peace. But... Um, as far as the, the welcome packets, it's been really incredible because we set up essentially a Google spreadsheet. Mm. And so when families are diagnosed, they go to the Coffin Cyrus Syndrome Foundation page and um, fill out an intake form, and that kicks back. And a lot of times they share... You know, they share where they're located, and they can be... They're all over the world, these families... And they share a little bit about their child, but sometimes it's adults. Like with whole, whole exome sequencing, we're getting a lot more information with gen rare genetic syndromes. And people that were misdiagnosed with other disorders are finding out for 20, 30 years, they've been, you know, yeah. been told one thing and really they're living with a different syndrome, which I my heart really goes out to to those people. I mean, sure. some people are out, still out there searching for their genetic syndrome. So I feel like we are fortunate to have that answer. Yeah. That piece of the puzzle. Yeah. How many, um, since you started doing that, how many welcome packets have oh. been sent out? Um, I need to get the number to the board. They just asked because every year we like to give like a little blast of how many families we reached. Um, we were only sending packets up until last year to U.S. families be just because of the cost sure. of postage. Yeah. Um, then I went back to the board and asked them if we could create a digital format. Yeah. So now we're able to reach everybody all over the world. Without delay. Without delay. Yeah. The click of a button yeah. and people can re receive a packet, which is pretty fantastic. Um, I'm really proud of us for being able to do that and be there for other families because that feeling of so much uncertainty when the doctor calls you and says, we have an answer. Yeah. We don't know anything else about this syndrome, right. but we have a name. Yeah. You get to be the people that say, we have a little bit more answers. Yes. We have because we have, yeah. you know, we have a geneticist that works with coffin Cyrus syndrome who we have people who re are researching it. Yeah and staying on top of the new discoveries. Yeah. Yeah. So um, Orin just celebrated ten, a 10th birthday. Yes. Which is a pretty big deal. That's a pretty big milestone Huge. for any kid, those hitting the double digits. Yes. Um, what was that milestone like for him and for you guys as a family? Um, for him, I, you know, Orin's just learning to understand birthday celebrations. I don't know that he fully grasped it, but he certainly loves to be celebrated mm -hmm. and he uh, loves to open presents. <laughs> Who doesn't? Yeah. yeah. We had a, a Lego party for him this past Saturday, which was a lot of fun. And he almost got, there was almost a sense of overwhelming, to, you know, it was yeah. overwhelming to him. <laughs> um, for me, for, for me, his... 10th birthday was exciting and I was eager to celebrate him but I also had a flood of emotions of everything that we've endured 
the past 10 years, um, you know, we just, our life has been spent with therapists and doctors and testing and a lot of extra support in every area and advocating in schools for education and the best support for him. So nothing with Oren comes easy and that has, you know, it's, it's a lot to process, but we've also had days where I, I mentioned that we've worried if, you know, how long Oren, we were going to have Oren with us mm -hmm. just because he gets, he turns corners very quickly. He gets sick very quickly and he needs a lot of medical support really quickly. But then thankfully he so far has, you know, turned corners the other way and he's a fighter and very resilient and determined to just get back to taking that breath. Yeah. Yeah. So f you mentioned for him, it's really the major, the, the largest risk or um, challenge he has to keep it, you have to keep a close eye on is respiratory. Yes. Um, whereas um, in other situations, it's heart or it's, you know, in the same diagnosis. Is the respiratory common? It is for other? very common. Yes. I think especially with the arid 1B, okay. it seems like. Um, yeah, for Oren, it always feels like it's something. I feel like we get one thing under control. We, we have his respiratory under control and we're healthy and we're shielding him from viruses. And then seizures will be on the horizon mm -hmm. and uncontrollable. Um, you know, he takes a lot of medication to help keep him healthy. And that, you know, medication is only so good mm -hmm. because he's growing. And so keeping up with that support system and that intervention is always really challenging. Yeah. Um, Oren's older brother, Beckett, is with us. We tried to get him mic'd up, but he refused. Um, but I'm curious what, how you describe the relationship between the two of them. Oh. Um, Beckett has been an exceptional brother. He, yes, you have been. You're right. You know. Um, and... I feel really fortunate because Beckett was two when Oren was born and he was just in love with him from the moment he, what we, you know, introduced the two and he still to this day, I mean, it was just yesterday that I left the room and I listened to Beckett have a full conversation with Oren about a yo-yo hmm. and sharing and teaching with teaching him. And I was just, you know, I stood back and listened to it and I came back into the room and I asked Beckett, you know, what he was talking about or talking to Oren about. And he just shared that he, what he was sharing with Oren and teaching him about a yo-yo and what it was. But for me, that was amazing because Oren is completely nonverbal, but Beckett, has always been very engaging with his brother. Mm -hmm. He always includes him in what's going on and teaches him and talks to him as if he was communicating back. Um, Beckett has been with us when we've had to call the squad multiple times and he's had to be in the driveway waving down the ambulance so they can find our house quickly and he has seen his brother in really frightening medical emergencies so I think for Oren he is I don't know I hope he knows how lucky he is to have a brother like Beckett yeah so I'm sure to uh to hear that conversation from the other room had to, had to make your mom heart pretty, pretty yes. proud. Yeah, it just, yeah, it makes me really proud of Beckett. And, you know, all we ever want is our kids to be kind and sympathetic and understanding. And 
when I hear those moments from Beckett, I, it reminds me that, like, okay, yeah, we're doing a good job. <laughs> yeah. What is Oren's school life like? What's he What's he like or and dislike about school? Yeah. So last year we um, hired a family attorney to kind of help us navigate the waters of getting Oren out of public school and into Bridgeway Academy, which is an autism school. It's a private school. Um, it's it's an extremely difficult task to to get your public school, which our public school is amazing and our neurotypical kids do amazing and amazing things in school, but unfortunately their special education programs are not what Oren needs. They were not able to support what my child needed. So we spent probably nine months advocating to get him moved and, you know, getting public school to districtly place him, which allowed Oren to not only go to that school, go to the school, but also because the tuition is very high for anything you've put special education sure. in front of, um, the, that would have all, all been out of pocket. So it took a lot of advocating to get Oren into what we now know was the absolute best decision we could have made for him. Because it's an autism school, they use a lot of ABA. There's one-on-one -on -one, um, BCBA teachers with him. Somebody is with him at all times. So he has that full support to help with those behaviors and transitions. And they're teaching him not only academics, but also independence and life skills, which are so important for him in the future. So he, although he may always need support, you know, ha seeing Oren have independence in the future to be able to do things mm -hmm. on his own will be, I it just, it makes me feel good that we're, we're setting him up for success. Yeah. What about what has what have you what reports have you gotten of things that he actually really yeah. likes? In yeah, school? he loves gross motor. He loves running around the gym with his friends. He, he loves recess. Um, there is nothing cuter than seeing five to six nonverbal kids play so beautifully together. They just it is it's amazing they have so much fun together yeah. just playing and being around each other yeah Oren loves school he he gets private transportation and he loves school he loves going to school which is amazing yeah, yeah. um how would please stop um obviously we're all month of January, we're um, shouting love for three amazing kids instead of just one. Um, how would you describe your relationship with Julia and Pam and what that has meant to you in this journey? Yeah, I think Julia and Pam and I hit it off right off the bat. Like we just, it was kind of like instant friendships. <laughs> um, I think they were just two women who were in very similar situations to us, just lots of uncertainty. All of our kids are so different. Mm -hmm. um, even though they have the same, they share the same diagnosis, um, we just, we just clicked. They get it. They get that the little inch stones are important to celebrate. But they also get that hard days are hard days. Right. Yeah, I love them. They're just fantastic women. Um, what has the word advocate doesn't hold as much weight for very many people, but un until they're put in a situation where they have to like, become an advocate. And I'm wondering what that word maybe meant to you before you had Oren and what that word means to you now and how that's changed over time. Before Oren, 
gosh, I probably never used that word. Mm -hmm. I probably didn't know the true meaning of what that word meant. Now, ugh, most of our days are spent with, you know, some level of advocating, advocating, you know, to have a home health care aid, um, advocating for services of any kind. Ugh, I just feel like we're constantly advocating. <laughs> And, you know, even in the school, even though he loves school, even there, you know, I still have to advocate my concerns to his teachers because they are working with multiple kids. Right. And so it's, it's always important to make sure that I'm advocating for what's most important at this time yeah. for him. Yeah. It's just, a, it requires a lot of communication. Having a child like Oren, it's a team effort. And that was probably our hardest part is just, I knew my vision and what I wanted for Oren, and I have high expectations for him and his support. But if everybody's not pulling their own weight, it becomes really difficult. One of those examples would be he has a speech generated device that allows him to speak words at the touch of a button. But if I'm the only one implementing it, then he only thinks he has to use it with me. Mm -hmm. So that we've spent years working with teachers and aides and any level of support to get everybody on board to use that device. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's just an example of what kind of advocating goes into. Sure. Yeah. And just advocating with his physicians. Thankfully, Nationwide Children's has been amazing and Oren has had a majority of the same physicians his entire life that know him, that have watched him change throughout the years and his level of needs and his medical diagnosis throughout the years. But there's still times where we have to advocate for what he needs or what our concerns are at that time. Sure. But. What are your dreams for him in the next year or so? Like, what are those inch stones that he's working towards that you're hoping a year from now you can kind of, you will you have celebrated along the way? Oh, you know, I don't really set too many goals for Oren because many, many years ago when he, you know, as a toddler, I thought he had to meet a goal by a certain amount of time. Mm -hmm. And I kind of changed my mindset into when Oren's ready, he'll do this. Oren is setting the pace. So goals I have for him, eventually it would be really nice to not have him in diapers. Uh, it would be nice to be able to tell him that that's not safe, please don't do that. But he doesn't really understand that. Just sure. really just safety. You know, hygiene would be great. <laughs> he needs a lot of support with, you know, we're still helping him get dressed. He's getting there. So I really don't set in my mind. I love for, you know, things to be a certain way, but I also am realistic in knowing that Oren will set the pace. Sure. But getting dressed is one of those things that he's working towards. Yes. He's making improvements and working yeah. towards being able yeah. to grow into needing less assistance with that. Yes, yeah. and he loves to pick his clothes out. He loves to put his clothes away. Like laundry is one of his favorite things to do right hey, now. Hey, that's a major win, Yes, right? he loves to. <laughs> it was just a few weeks ago and he asked Bobby to help him. You know, he was carrying his laundry basket down the stairs, which obviously is not safe. So, you know, Bobby was helping him and he was like, what are we doing with this? And Oren took it to the laundry room and started the washer and was putting his clothes in. and. So he was like, oh, I guess we're doing your laundry right now. <laughs> yeah, he loves to do laundry and hang it up, but he needs a lot of support with that. Yeah. So, yeah. If you could tell a younger version of yourself um, one thing uh, going into before the diagnosis, what would you go back and tell yourself? Probably that 
everything's going to be okay. Like everything happens for a reason. If it's not okay, you know, you'll get through it. I just, yeah, it's just everything will work out. And it's going to be uncomfortable and painful and scary at times, but, you know, we just take it a day at a time. At Go Shout Love, we do amazing things for amazing families with kids on rare medical journeys. Each month, we shout love for families through the sale of creative apparel inspired by the kids. This month's Stay Curious design is inspired by Oren, Ruby, and Stella, three amazing kids who are always up for an adventure and shine a bright light wherever they go. Every purchase in January will help with the cost of adaptive bicycles for Ruby and Stella and a special trip for Oren and his family. Visit our website at goshout.love to support these three amazing kids through the purchase of a t-shirt, hat, sweatshirt, hoodie, or other items.